Hello, everybody. How's everybody doing tonight? Mm. Good, good. Uh, welcome to the 14th Annual Penn World Voices Festival. I'm Rob Spillman. I'll be your interviewer for tonight. Uh, just a quick reminder, please silence your cell phones. Uh, just to take a second to do that. You too, Googie. Um, and uh, for those of you who do not know about Penn and its uh, Penn and its mission to celebrate literature and defend free expression, we're going to show a very brief little video explaining, and then we'll be right back. Sound optional, of course. <laughs> I'm going to narrate it. <laughs> that was it. Hey. All right. Well, I think you got the idea. Um, Penn does. Uh, oh, wait. Maybe. Maybe not. Um, well, Penn does. Uh, defend freedom of expression around the world and defend imprisoned writers all over the world. So um, I think it is uh, particularly fitting that uh, we are here to welcome um, one of our world's most foremost storytellers and ad outspoken advocate for worldwide freedom of expression, the Kenyan novelist, essayist, playwright, memoirist, and theorist of post-colonial literature, who is currently the distinguished professor of English and comparative literature at the University of California, Irvine, Gugiwa Tiango. Please welcome him, everybody. Oh, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So it's a real honor to be here with you uh, tonight. And you've um, recently released uh, and revised your 1980 prison memoir, Wrestling with the Devil, which is just out here in the US for the very first time. In it, he recounts his harrowing account of becoming prisoner K-677, meaning that he was the sixth political prisoner admitted into the infamous Kamati maximum security prison in 1977. Held indefinitely with no charges in the informer insane asylum, wrestling with the devil, recounts his resistance by writing in his native Gikoyo an entire novel on hidden toilet paper. Um, could you read a little bit for us? So we oh. get a little flavor. Okay. Thank you. No. First of all, let me say how uh, I really appreciate all your presence here, and especially in the context of. Uh, Wild Voices Festival, uh, Penn. Actu actually, I, I first came to New York way back before I think most of you were born. This was <laughs> 1966. And the reason I came here was uh, in a, another festival, a writer's festival organized by International Penn when Adam Miller was the president. And that particular pen conference was important because it was trying to break the barrier between the two sides of the Cold War. I mean, the writers that were on either side of the Cold War, as those from the Eastern uh, Europe and those from Western Europe, and others like us from Africa, uh, Latin America. It was a very important conference, yeah. and so many things happened. Yeah, so I've got very. Being here today sort of takes me back to that conference in 1966. Uh, and of course, the, I really appreciate the work done my, by Penn on my behalf when I was uh, later arrested and put in a maximum security prison in 19, from December that first 1977 to December 1978. And this was simply on account of having participated in the writing of a play 
and performance of a play uh, written in my mother tongue, the Koyo language, uh, performed by regular folk, people, working people, factory workers, plantation workers, villagers, you know, uh, in their own language. And, uh, and I thought I was doing a very good job, you know, because <laughs> I was professor at the University of Nairobi, but sort of moving to the village, I thought it was a good patriotic thing I'm doing together with the people in the <laughs> language they speak and so on. But obviously, the post-colonial government at the time had a different mindset, and um, the play was stopped. I'll matter when I want. It's quite, I'll matter when I want in English translation. It was stopped, and I was this midnight of December 1977, armed police came to my house in Limuru, and I was, the following morning, I found myself in a maximum security prison, the biggest prison in my country at that time, yeah, probably in Africa at the time. Uh, uh, when, yeah, I just want to imagine, I'm a writer, I've published four novels by that time, including Whip No Child, The River Between a Grain of Wheat, and Peter's blood. I am professor of literature at the University of Nairobi. In fact, I'm the chair of the department, right? But the following day, all the, I'm a prisoner without a name, just a number which was mentioned uh, at the, during the introduction, yeah. No paper, no pen. The problem is how, the challenge is how does an intellectual who is used to books, pen, and paper survive under those kind of you know, uh, conditions? No books, no pen, and nothing. Your life completely regulated from morning to evening, and every activity, including the most personal, uh, like going to the bathroom, you are under, people are following you to see what you are doing, right? Uh, so, uh, I had two very important encounters in prison, which I, in some ways, I think they helped trigger uh, my writing of that novel uh, called Devil on the Cross uh, in prison. Uh, of course, I wrote in a Gikoyo language. Shaitan Mudarapaine, as it's called. And now, but the argument, what happened was this. When I was put in maximum security prison, I, was there, I found other political pris prisoners. There was very many, but I, I was under what is called internal segregation, meaning they were not allowed to speak to me, and I was not allowed to speak to them. And there's something very... It's very strange. I mean, not, actually, it's, very, it's like a real punishment for people around you. You can't speak to, you can see them, but you cannot interact with them, or they're not allowed to interact with you. You feel like, I don't know what, like, anyway, it's not a very good feeling. That's all I can say. Uh, although I must say the political prisoners were very good because they would walk at the required distance and talk among themselves. Then I realized, and they would start giving a device to themselves, to each other. And then, they, then I realized, oh, they are telling me. <laughs> they are communicating to themselves, saying, oh, when you are here, you swear so you must be this and this. So I realized they were talking to me by talking to themselves. Because at first I was wondering, why are they giving advice to each other? <laughs> 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 right, yeah. Um, after being in internal segregation uh, for some time, then who turns up? A priest uh, with a collar, quite, you know, I don't, many, many of you are Christian, you know that people, priests wear a white collar here. Yeah. And, but he had a prison uniform, but with a collar here, okay? And the, the thing I noted immediately was two very big Bibles, eh? with a big cross, eh? okay? 
so uh, we started arguments, you know. Uh, now, the thing he did not probably know is that I grew up sort of, you know, reading the Bible. So we started arguing, and he would mention one passage in the Bible to prove his point. Then I would quote another passage in the Bible that actually said the opposite of what you're saying. <laughs> and we went on and on. And then he told me, ah, you educate the people. You, you, you argue too much. But remember, you can never argue your way to heaven. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, but how this argument stays with me, I'm going to read a section where my argument with the priest keeps on coming back. Um, my argument with the reverend keeps on coming back to me. I grew up with the Bible, mostly the Old Testament, and most of the characters, Abraham, Isaac, David, Joseph, were my early companions in my village. This was because when I learned to read and write, the only book readily available was the Greek language, Old Testament. I enjoyed some magical moments, you know, you talk about magical realism uh, in Latin America, but actually, <laughs> <laughs> just try the Old Testament. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, like Jonah surviving three days in the belly of a fish. <laughs> Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego surviving fiery flames. But for me, it's the survival part that is the most appealing because it could be in a fire of flames and come out without a burn. Well, or belly of a fish, and I'm assuming it's belly of a prison, maybe. But some sections of the New Testament as well. The Sermon on the Mount, John the Baptist surviving his sojourn in the wilderness on honey and wild berries. The devil tempted him to quit. Ah, the devil once even dared tempt Jesus. They had wrestled with the devil and emerged stronger from the contest. I think, did the reverend come to tempt me? I resent the fact that they, the, pre the warders, cannot tell us a thing about the outside, not even about rain or wind or sunshine. Birds fly far above the walls of the prison. I wish they could lend me their wings just, just for a day. Ah, what would I do with them? Ah, I know visit my family, my village. Uh, uh, but also what? Oh yes, go to all the houses and offices of those in power. Make mischief. <laughs> yeah. Or land at caves where they are planning corruption and scatter their plates and knives. You know, kind of practical jokes. And then back here. Oh, no, 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 no. I wouldn't come back here. I will not come back to this confinement. Ah. But the fun is in going and coming back at will and enjoying their foolishness in thinking they can confine me within their man-made walls. But wait a minute. But this going and coming back is what actually I do night and day. I visit my family. I walk on the streets of Kenya. My imagination is my wings of glory. I know what I'm going to do. I know that's what I must do in English. That would be fun. Writing a novel in a language that made them bring me here. 
Yes, combine fun with fight and flight. Ah. But no story would come. In a case, I need paper, pen, writing material. The warders have plenty. I want to write something, I tell them, hinting it might be even be a confession. The older political prisoners had told me of the trick. It always works, they had told me, because that's what they want us to do, confess. And indeed, the chief warder readily complies with my request for paper to write my confession. A ballpoint. But only a few sheets, never mind. I can supplement that with, well, toilet paper. <laughs> Good. But the idea of a novel eludes me. But soon another idea steals my sleep. It begins to form a shape around a competition among where the robbers oh, not forming. Okay. Jesus and the devil come back to my mind. I still wrestle with my arguments with the Reverend. The idea that it was the devil and not Christ who should have been executed on the cross plays my mind. Jesus was an opponent of Roman imperialism, a proponent of the kingdom of the least among us, a visionary who saw the poor among whom he walked as inheriting the earth. The devil was an ally of Roman imperialism and its oppressive practices, a self-serving criminal whose followers, exploiters of the poor, have as much chance of entering heaven as a camel through the eye of the needle. I know. A competition of modern robbers organized by the devil. Ah. But the story still refuses to form. And then comes the second encounter, which I want to mention. Uh, the the warders who are guarding us were really regular, sort of ordinary, sort of, you know, um, poorly pro 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 paid, you know. Um, uh, uh, but they were, most of them were co speakers, they, like me. Like, okay. Mm -hmm. So one day, one out of the blue, you know, one of the warders starts really attacking me, not physically, but with words. I mean, he's putting on the defensive. He tells me, the trouble with you educated people is that you despise your languages. You don't like talking to ordinary people. But what use is your education if it cannot be shared with your own people? Let me tell you, you may possess all the book education in the world, but we, ordinary people, in tattered clothes with bare feet, and blistered hands who have the real knowledge of things. Let me tell you, if I was to wear a suit today, you'd see me a different person. But it would not mean that I had suddenly acquired more knowledge and wisdom than I had when I was wearing tattered clothes. Have you seen any European calling himself Mutiso, Kamau, Onyango, Kiplagat or Simiu? Have you seen Europeans abandoning their languages and bothering about our own languages? Let me tell you something else. Yes, I may not have book knowledge, but even a child can give you a word that might benefit you. You people, even if you follow Europeans to the grave, they will never let you really know the secrets of their languages. They will never mark my words. Europeans will never let you into the secrets held by their languages. Then what do you, what do you then become? They are slaves. Now, what to say, the irony is that, you know, remember, I'm here in prison 
for writing a play <laughs> in the language, okay? But I suspect he did not believe that was the real reason because he couldn't see why a language should, okay? So he's attacking me as a member of an oppressing class, uh, elite, and he somehow or other as a member of the oppressed. I mean, it was a very interesting <laughs> twist of all oh, that. Yeah. Uh, but there's a kind of fr frank bitterness in his voice that shows much sincerity in his, ho in his holding me and my class responsible for the cultural plight of Kenya. I think he is utterly unconscious of the fact that what he is saying, why he to try and put it into practice outside, could land him in this very detention block. Mm. I cannot answer him. I'm itching to tell him about the Camarillo experiment, but I know that if I do, if I so much as mention the name Camarillo, he will freeze in terror, to change the subject, and move away from the door of cell number 16. But his talk has turned me in ways that he'll never know. That night, I sit down, I sit at the desk and start the story of Waringa in the Kuyo language. I don't know how, but the idea of a competition of robbers organized by the devil becomes central to Waringa's adventures. It flows just like that, and for the first time since my incarceration, I feel transports of joy. That which I've always toyed with but feared, writing a novel in Igekweo, is happening before my own eyes. And I have government toilet paper for writing material, and a government paid order as a consultant. <laughs> <laughs> I'm ever willing to learn in prison more so. And now let me just show you something. This is a, a reproduction of the toilet paper. <laughs> this one. Uh, okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks so much. I think we need, we need a little more information about the actual toilet paper. It's become such a mythic uh, thing. Uh, Can you describe uh, the actual toilet paper? Yeah. As I told you, this is the actual, not the actual because it's a reproduction. Mm -hmm. It was exactly this shape. This is my writing in a coil in prison. This. Right. Uh, and how, how, how thick was the there toilet paper? Oh, thick like this. No, wait a minute. There are two things about the paper. First of all, it was a bundle. Just like if you remove these hard covers, they will be like this shape. Mm -hmm. But a bit hard. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not like softy, softy kind, you know, <laughs> like used today. Uh, like the kind they advertise on television. <laughs> okay. Uh, this one, I think, was meant to punish us prisoners. So, yeah. <laughs> so it was a bit hard, I think, for the body, but very good writing material. Yeah. <laughs> so it actually caught the pen. It was oh, like, oh, yes, yeah. held the pen very well. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So when people imagine toilet paper, they think of Charmin, not uh, this like rough uh, sandpaper that yeah. you were given as a punishment. That actually turned out to be a great. Yeah, they are, you know, mm. you know tell me that these two, I think it's bad. I don't want to, when they're child, and they, they bring this flash, nice, so soft. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not that kind. <laughs> yeah. Do you still have the original manuscript? Do you have yeah, you actually, kept? I lost a bit of it, but some of it is now with Indiana University. Yeah. Uh, uh, okay. uh, they have my archives. Indiana University, I think they, they will make them public soon, yeah. Wonderful. So we will be able to consult the, we will to touch the toilet paper. Huh? <laughs> it's, uh, but not smelly. It's okay, I can, <laughs> as much I can assure you. <laughs> um, 
Let, yeah. uh, let's back up a little bit to what landed you in prison. You write in the book, the six months between June and November 1977 were the most exciting in my life and the true beginning of my education. Um, so you were working with the people of your village, right, in a collaborative yeah, way. Yes, yeah. This is, okay, again, let me ex explain a little bit. The, the village is, is called Camerezo. It's about 30 kilometers from Nairobi. My, and uh, as I said at the time, I am uh, chair of Department of Literature. I'm professor, you know, remember. <coughs> <laughs> <laughs> Pro look. Professor carry a lot of pain. Anyway, um so I am professor. I'm chair of the department. I'm internationally known as novelist or whatever. Now I choose to go and work with literally peasants, you know, landless folk in the village, factory workers, plantation workers, you know, to produce a play together. Now, this is a question. If you if you go to a place to work with them, or I mean any community anywhere, no matter who you are, you really have to work in the language they use. Eh? You can go to a place where they speak English only, say in a part of uh, New York, and they speak English only, and you tell them, no, no, I want us to have this very big community project here in New York, but in uh, it's Zulu, huh? <laughs> right? You know, obviously that's, <laughs> but this is what, in a sense, we're expected to do with educated people in Africa, even today. This is what we're expected to do. To do. We produce our intellectual production is always either in English, in French, or Portuguese. And I tell you, the majority of people in Africa, they may speak many languages, but the majority in each of the language community don't speak French or English. Yeah. So all the information we gather, all the research we do about medicine, about health, and everything else, is coded in English or French and so on. So in a sense, we are trying to do something different, saying, okay, I'm in this village, we want to produce a theater, community theater, so we only use the language that people use, and it's, it's we now from the university who had to learn that language and expression if we were serious about working with the people. There's no other way, right? Yeah. So that's the play, as I said, was called Al Mare When I Want, Gahika Adeda. It's actually a kind of musical, it's full, it's actually very, 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 I mean, ah, it was <laughs> nice. I wish I could sing some of the songs, eh? <laughs> to show you a little bit of it, yeah. yeah. Um, the thing about it was uh, the play, because it reflected the conditions of factory workers and the landless and so on, the people I think identified with the images that came across on the stage. It's as if they could see themselves. So the result was something we had never seen before in Kenya. People came from different parts of the area and other parts of the country to come and see what was happening in this particular village. And the other thing, me, me, let me just say, one of the things which I saw transformation through my eyes, two things happened. One, when we said English is not the means of communication here, power relationship actually changed, okay? Because the people of the area, they were the one who knew the language probably better than we did, we from the university. Yeah? So uh, English removing it, we changed the power 
relation between us from the university and and uh, and the people. The other thing which I noted was, initially when we, we went there, the those of us from the university were treated as if we are saviors. And some, I remember some of the early songs were singing about me and my other friend, Guguamiri, and now he passed on. Uh, now, so, we had a long, big debate. Everything was, used to be debated communally. No bring solutions from anywhere. We just sat down and talked about, you know. We said, this story we are writing or we are performing is talking about your lives, right? Factory, you know. Do I go out and work in the factory? No. Uh, do I do this? No. Uh, you are the one. This is your story. So why are you sing about me? <laughs> right? Right? Now, they were always used to singing about a savior from elsewhere, either from the universities or from Nairobi. And then from Nairobi, their savior was, came from England or whatever. And, and we say, no, let's sing about ourselves collectively. Let's sing what we have done. By we, I meant what they have done, you know. So if you th we said something like this. If you, we debated, if you think of a hero who is, is there an example of a hero in this village who was part of the struggle? So let's sing about what we collectively. So no more sing about Gogoadi or Gogoamberi. It be we, what we have done in history. Now, what we noted at some time, the transformation, the sense that we, yeah, we, not just they, we huh, have done this. We have done this. It was very transforming, that sense that we are makers of history or we are makers. Something, and that's about, that's something about which was very uh, touching to see this uh, transformation. Mm -hmm. So there were those changes which we, and that's why for me it was transformative. Yeah. First, to see those changes, and also for me, language-wise, uh, remember the play, not the novel, was the first that I wrote in Igbo language as a play, right? Mm -hmm. And so, so, but the language which we, Guamiri and I, had used initially in the first draft was. They were laughing when we read it, you know, it was very publicly. We were laughing <laughs> at some of our usages, okay? And they were now giving us a lesson, literally, is something. <laughs> the, the lessons which we used to give at the university about uh, uh, words and imagery and all that, you know, uh, now they're giving the lecture to us. <laughs> and they were saying, an old person, say, of an advanced age, would not sp if you if he uses those words, he sounds like a child or like a young person. Yeah, you must find words and images which reflect the different ages and so on. And here you must, an old man cannot speak without a couple of proverbs, right? So you get find proverbs. Yeah. So all that was is this kind of collective. It's, uh, I, unless you experience it, it's very difficult to, to describe because there was, it was actually transforming. Mm -hmm. Not only they, but we, who are from the Inuma, we are being transformed, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, you also, you yeah. write that, um, mm -hmm. that uh, the powerful couldn't believe that the actors were amateurs. They said that you must be sneaking them in, you know, yeah. because they yeah. were so good. That's another thing. Once the play, uh, first of all, let me describe the phenomenon, how we did it. Yeah. Everything was through discussions. There was no question of a director coming and telling this what you do or you don't do. Huh? Uh, you even uh, what you call no casting. This is what I remember. It was done publicly. I mean, anybody could walk in and just become part of the uh, casting. And I remember some of the Actor, there was one actor. I remember. Let me just tell you, this was interesting. One of the actors 
was actually a member of the audience eh? and he commented on another actor who was trying to act out the part of a rich person and this guy no no they don't walk like this so he stood up to show how they eh, they <laughs> walk eh, with uh, whatever you know uh, how they walk you know eh, right and the audience had just <laughs> applauded. <him. laughs> That's how he came to act to play that role. He w initially he was demonstrating to the other one how to do it, and the audience sort of you know participating audience sort of uh, clapped him into uh, doing the uh, part. You know, mm -hmm. so it is this participatory thing that was very very important. You know. Uh, Hmm. Even then, uh, let me show you something. I don't know I've got it here. The the layout of the uh, the configuration of the. Is it here? Yeah, you have a picture of it oh in yeah, that the beginning. Let me see. Uh, well. you, using matchsticks to lay out how the actual theater would look. The open air mm. theater was constructed by the, from the beginning, and uh, uh, the way they d did it. Is I th I remember it because I was not I was not part of the group. Uh, I was doing something else. I had gone to uh, get something else because each each person was part of a group. You had to do things in a group all the time. So uh, the construction group sat to get together, and they used matchsticks to c to, to imagine an open air theater, you know. There is in fact a picture of it, I think there somewhere. Uh, yeah. Okay, here They'll is have to buy the book, he so. He confirms know. that, okay. No, what I'm trying to say, that sense of doing things together, almost like you are doing things and you are, okay, it's actually you are bringing together your different knowledges, the people that way, you know. If I come from the university, I have got my own area of experience or knowledge. If I come from a factory, working in a factory, the, the person who works in a factory has their own area of experience. And there's no way I can say that because I teach at the university, because I'm a, a professor, therefore I know about the factory conditions or the experience of working in a plantation. Or in some of the actors also happen to have been part of the liberation movement. So some of them had been used to making guns, you know, in the fa factory, uh, gun making factories in the mountains, you know. Uh, I can't say I have that experience, you know. So how to stand, there are things which people themselves would begin to say, this is how you do this, this is how you do this. And somehow uh, through this kind of exchange here, you know, conf different views sort of, you came out with something which was really very, very, you know, uh, moving. Yeah. You know. So, and you can uh, see why it would be uh, terrifying uh, to uh, the strongman government, which is top-down, you know, authority. Right. Yeah. My, I have a little theory myself about all government everywhere, you know, more and more in the world. I, I, I really believe people, leaders all over the world, they like to be the ones who know <laughs> for some reason. They're like always, you know, I enjoy, I mean, I like, I don't like commenting too much on American politics, but I really do, sometimes when people are standing for elections here, like pres it's very interesting. They always say what I will do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> always, I, I will do this for you. I have this plan for you. Huh? I have this. It's I, I, what I will do. Hmm? Now, at Camerado, the I part of it was actually banned more or less. You know, you didn't say I will tell you what to do. Mm. Uh, I know and I'll show you what to do. No. You so can show me and so can he, so can she. Yeah. Uh, all of us. We can bring our different experiences and we get it's yeah. transforming this much I do, this I can tell you, and there's no way of telling anybody until one has experienced it, it is transforming, internal transformation. The same person will be probably having the same tattered clothes, but the way they look 
the, 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 the lack of fear, not arrogance, but sort of curiosity also becomes sharpened, you know. Uh, I remember some visitors to the center, people would ask them very sharp questions. Uh, you know, they were, they were curious. It's as if they wanted to connect their own specific experience at Camerido with their own experiences, whatever they have come from. Okay, you know. So, yeah, it's kind of... It does right. sound transformative. Yeah, it's, right. it's so hard work. I mean, it's yeah. not, you know, they have <laughs> lots of argument. <laughs> yeah. Please, please be, don't think of it as something which was happening. Everybody was ha seeing happily every right. single day. <laughs> no, no, no. Sometimes there are right. very strong arguments, and you thought, oh my God, this thing is going to collapse. You know, huh? you know, factions. You know, strong points of view. Huh? Mm -hmm. uh, let me give you another example. Uh, we had one architect from the University of Nairobi. Uh, studying architecture and since we welcomed anybody who wanted to be part of the project we welcomed anybody as long as you participated in the project like everybody else so when he came there he was put i thought i think he thought you'd come and tell people how to build hmm. instead no he was told no no you know it's okay fine but you you be working with that group the the building the builders group who are peasants and the worker from the factory i mean you know so i think the architect had a, a rather hard time because i thought he was thinking he was coming to tell them huh? but they were arguing with him back and i don't think he liked that very much uh they argue at one point i remember them arguing this was reported to me how the location of some of the seats you know huh? And he talks about the sun, okay? Then it looked as if he was winning the argument. Then following one of the peasants came and said, but wait a minute. <laughs> you know, although in the equator, the sun changes, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, so you cannot really use that as itself as an argument, right? Uh, and our architect friend actually left the project <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah so for your troubles you you wound up imprisoned um for trying to do this and uh, it was kafkaesque when you landed there uh, you, the other political prisoners the handful of political prisoners some had been there a few months some one up to yeah. 10 years 10 years yeah and you mm -hmm. were not charged with anything and you were not told how long you were going to be there no. But you were asked mm. to, mm. you could confess, though. Confess your sins. Yeah, you could confess <laughs> whatever your sins yeah. were. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how did you, yeah. I mean, how did you even wrap your head around that idea of indefinite intention uh. for a crime no, it you're was, not even charged it, it, it for? It was um, hard. Uh, but the most important thing is that, it, f for me, again, let me put myself as if I was, just they are going I was working with other people, okay? So the notion that you are not alone in prison, although you are in prison, you are in some ways are representing other people outside prison, that's also, also a very important sense of, you don't feel as isolated uh, as, uh, yeah. But still it was very hard, you know, I don't want to lie. And it was ah prison, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm a tough guy. I'll show them how tough. <laughs> it can be very depressing. The sameness, mundane, mundane, everything, you know. Yeah. Uh, and also not yeah. knowing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, knowing. some when you yeah. know you're going to be in for a year, yeah. you can, but you might be in there for ten years, right? Yeah. When. Uh, yeah, political detention without trial, because that's what mine was, and those others whom I found there, you know, is you are detained and you can be released at whenever the president wills it. Uh, so technically, you can be released after on one day, uh, after one week, after a year, after 10 years, or you might die in prison. There's no, <laughs> there's no, there's no way you can say, I can tough it out 
for a year, two years, ten years. You are also something else, and something not knowing. Yeah, there's nothing to expect, so you don't know, and that was also very very uh, hard yeah. because you couldn't organize your thinking about survival, saying I can endure it for, uh, and I can count first day, two days. No, mm -hmm. it's a thing. It's doing the same thing over and over again. Mm -hmm. And this is why I might say, this is why imagination, I came to respect, sorry, imagination uh, as, um, as really this wonderful possession we have as human beings. It makes I do so many wonderful things, including imagining buildings in our minds and then be able to, huh, to do it, you know. Mm -hmm. It makes us be to imagine what might be possible tomorrow. Huh? It means I imagine different worlds. Yeah? We can, uh, and remember the contest between repressive conditions and others. Repressive conditions, all those who are upholders of repressive conditions, they won't tell you all the time, this is the best, this is the, the best one of all possible worlds. Huh? I think it was um, Voltaire's Candide. Huh? <laughs> So, ah, everything. This is the best of all possible worlds, eh? Slavery. This is <laughs> the best of all possible worlds. Yeah, I mean, truly. I don't know that I guess, but you remember uh, in plantation slavery, people who ran away were diagnosed as, as having a mental illness. Eh? Because why would they want to run away from this best of all possible worlds, you know? Uh, uh, so, the, the idea that people can imagine possibilities uh, becomes something which repress or condition try to repress, you know. Mm -hmm. so, but imagine something we have, very, very important, really. And this is what makes us really human in so many ways, you know. Mm -hmm. And but you also uh, resisted physically. I mean, you, I was struck by your your refusal to wear shackles. Even when you had to go an emergency dental visit, you refused to be shackled, so yeah. they didn't take you. But they it's said it would just be so much easier if you would wear yeah. shackles. It's the, idea, it's the idea of resistance. I don't know how, I know the word resistance is used quite a lot. Huh? But <laughs> the resistance actually is real. Huh? But people when they think of resistance, they might think of physical, you know, sort of, like some of those breaking through prisons and like James Bond or something, <laughs> all right? <laughs> uh, just resistance is just the capacity to say no to repressive conditions, you know? And once, so for me, let me, let me give, let me illustrate this so they know what we're talking about. Um, it came about uh, that no, when we were in the compound, we used to wear prison uniforms with white something. Our normal clothes were taken away and locked somewhere. Uh, but if you are going to visit a farm or you were allowed a family visit once in, uh, I don't even know, there was no, it was never guaranteed, it was always very sudden. You can go and see your uh, family. They would make people dress in their civilian clothes, okay? So, but then I was told that once they went and they'll be driven to the near the airport, uh, then before they could meet their, their, and they were handcuffed, but before they could meet their relatives, the hands were removed. So when they see their relatives, they are very well dressed and they are in at an airport the impression is that they come from very, very far away. <laughs> then the policeman or the, the armed whatever is around. When you, so there's nothing you can communicate. You can't communicate anything with your, to your family. So what really is happening here was that you were being made to play a game of, you become a part of sending a message to the world that things are not really as bad <laughs> as you might be thinking. Okay, because this is this message you are sending 
with your clothes, we are no handcuffs and uh, talking nothing we you know chatting around with the policeman around you know because you can't say anything more than just chat around about how is this and so on. so when I, and I, then i had noted that those who went whenever they came back they were more depressed <laughs> seeing their farm than they were before so when i came to my turn i put on my civilian clothes i went to the gate and then they were going to put handcuffs. I didn't mean to do that. I said, no. Huh? What? <laughs> <laughs> I said, no, you can't handcuff me. I mean, I'm not, no. Not that you can't. I'm, I'm not past me. I'm not put out my hands for you to handcuff me when I'm going to see my family. Yeah? But since you have the gun and everything else, if you grab my hands and handcuff, I mean, what can I do? I can't fight you, but I, I will not participate in uh, chaining. I'm, I don't be a participant in that process. But if you grab my hands and you want chain, it's up to you. I'm not your power, but I will not participate in that. Now, what I found very interesting, it became a game of will. Now, they wanted me to to be the one freely stretching my hands to be. You know, they refused to grab them and chain. No. It is like I had to do it like this. And I said, no. Right? I say, go back to the cell. And it would happen. Every time that happened, I would wear my clothes very nicely, or whatever it is, at the door, bring your hands. No. Go back. Yeah. That was, that was resist. For me, that was very, very important to be able to say, um, no, okay. It, it kind of, yeah, it actually felt good afterwards, <laughs> you know. Of course, it was very sad. I couldn't see my family, it really. I mean, it was, you know, yeah. Uh, oh, so your wife, uh, your yeah. wife was four months pregnant when yeah, you yeah. first yeah, entered yeah, prison, yeah. so you hadn't uh, seen uh, Yeah, your my child. daughter, um, Jockey, uh, uh, was born when I was in prison. Actually, yeah, they sent us, uh, I write about this in a memoir where they sent us her, my wife sent her a photo. I don't know how it did. Eventually, I got a photograph. And mm -hmm. all the prisoners were so happy. Huh? They felt like nothing, but there is the message of, I think, birth and whatever it is became an image of uh, rebirth and birth, the life anew and so on, you know. Uh, and the baptized had several names, including one, the post office baby. Huh? <laughs> Uh, because she ca she brought the message through the post office through uh, yeah. yeah yeah so besides physical resistance you, there was the mental resistance yeah. you you but came up with a three year plan but, but even right? th even that was mental in the sense that it's not as if they are grabbing my hands and I'm fighting them yeah no no no, no. I was not prepared to do that uh, please <laughs> the other pe <laughs> the other people they ask me how the how about the courage no I tell them no 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 no. I was terrified, <laughs> <laughs> please, you know. I was full of terror all the time, you know. Uh, courage is not something which is biologically determined. Because if it's biologically determined, then it's not courage, okay? Hmm? If you are courageous by virtue of a biological makeup, then it's not courage or not courage, just the way you are. But if you're terrified and they say no, to me, that's, <laughs> that's courage, yeah? Okay, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So when you determined to write the novel, you, you, you said you had a year plan to try to write in a year. And if you were there another year, you were going to translate it into Swahili. And then yeah. if you were there another year, you were going to translate it into English. Yeah. That was your, <laughs> I, that was your I was ambitious plan, I was right? planning, okay, yeah. write the novel in Ikuyo. Okay. Uh, of course, it was my first novel in the core language, so and it's, it was challenging. You know, uh, language can be very tough. You say one thing in the morning, you read the following morning, it says something different. So and you had to work on it. But I was thinking, yes, I'll work on the core version, 
Then another year, spent time translating to Kiswahili. Then another year or two years, uh, uh, translated into English. And maybe by that time, I'm gonna have an uh, idea for another novel. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, well, there are, of course, problems, you know, how to where to hide the novel. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, um, but I mean, it, it kept you sane and motivated, and, and and you had a routine, right? That you would yeah, uh, write at exactly. night. You see, with imagination, which is writing is part of imagination, you can create color, eh? music, mm. you can dance. You know, I mean, it really, is, uh, uh, you can see things. You can see green life. You can see birds, you know, uh, flying. You know, uh, sort of. Imagination can actually, actually, like, I think imagination is very helpful in so many ways. You yeah. can create your own world mm -hmm. uh, in a way, yeah. Uh, but me for writing a novel was very, very, very important to keep yeah. keeping me sane, mm -hmm. and also, in a sense, how should I say? You get a kind of I don't know what to call perverse pleasure, huh? In being able to, <laughs> okay, when I, when I was in prison, I started thinking about the language question very seriously, the language in a colonial side, because I was wondering why have I been put in prison by an African government for writing in an African language? And I had not been put in prison when I wrote very critical novels like Path of Blood but in English, right? So I think, what's, what is the role of language? In society? By the way, these thoughts were the ones which eventually became decolonizing the mind, by the way, just for, yeah. They were actually formed, you know, uh, uh, in prison, yeah. Anyway, I imagination. Yes. I don't, I'm trying not to go back there, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. So, and also, I imagine that you, I've always been struck in your work and all of your work by your use of satire and that, you know, uh, I'm thinking of, you know, Kenyan strongman Daniel, President Daniel Arup Moy famously ordered that the wandering hero of your novel, Madagari, be found and arrested. Uh, I think he was real and a real threat uh. to the regime. And when he, when he found out that he wasn't real, he actually ordered your book arrested and, <laughs> and cleaned out. And then in, uh, you know, in yeah. Wizard of the Crow, uh, you brilliantly mock the big men and their enablers, the psychophants. Um, what is it about satire in particular that gets under the skin of the uh, big men and the, uh, their enablers? No, I think satire is... Can, I used to wonder, you read my first no, few novels, like we, The River Between and uh, Play With No Child, and even A Grain of Wheat, but there's very little... They're not very really satiric, you know, they're, they're very serious, you know, sort of, mm -hmm. you know, uh, in tone. But this laughter can be very, <laughs> can be, oh, I know how to put it, you know. Satire can really, is like a sharp knife into a, a something, into a, it's, 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 it penetrates somewhere. When people are laughing at something, uh, if you can make people laugh, but at a serious, if what you're saying is very serious, but you can make people laugh, not laugh and say, oh, it doesn't matter, ha ha, we are enjoying ourselves. But, you know, no, not that kind of laughter, you know, although there's nothing wrong in enjoying oneself, you know. Uh, yeah, this, um, anyway, I don't know how to put it, but. The moment I started writing the novel, uh, uh, um, uh, Devil on the Cross in Igekoyo, the satiric element came of itself. First, I remember the novel talks about uh, a, a meeting in a cave uh, for the robbers, national robbers, to compete, to select the seven cleverest thieves and robbers. But those are people who not, not people who rob because they are hungry or because they have no clothes, but people who rob because 
they have more than enough. Huh? People who, who rob in billions, in other words, you know. Um, and the idea was that the the winner will be crowned. The you know will get a crown, and a crown will will be given to him by the international organization of thieves and robbers whose headquarters then i don't know about now eh? but then in my novel the headquarters of new york mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right uh but i don't know i've been looking for it since i came here and not found it but <laughs> <laughs> i think uh, it's a trump tower yeah uh. <laughs> but the international organization that was the crown you know so that from that premise the satiric element almost dictated itself, you know. Uh, okay, here are robbers. Uh, uh, they are measures to rob the people. Then to come and give a vision of how they can continue robbing the pe people, not by one dollar here and there, by billions. Not that's the real robber they want, okay? In fact, in the play, in the, in the novel, <laughs> there's one guy who comes, knocks at the door, he says he wants to participate in a competition. And he described, he told, okay, describe how you can be a thief. And he said, oh, me, when I'm very hungry and I see chicken in a village, I steal one. Ah, they are so angry <laughs> with him. He's kicked out of the competition, right? Mm. <laughs> you know, yeah. Because, they, you know, we don't, we don't miss about thieves and robbers. We want real thieves and robbers. That's whom we want here, okay? So... I found the satiric element sort of almost developing from the very premises of robbery and theft as a, what, well, as what makes what you call modern societies, you know. If you think of, well, think of what we call modernity, uh, capitalism, for instance, you know, because at the heart of it, it's a system of robbery, huh? actually, robbery all the time. Yeah, so, you you but once you develop that as a supremacist, then literally you can see how satirical, it's this, the satire drives itself. Then as a you can come very uh, hilarious, like, one time there's a character who tells how, how they're going to make sure that the air people breathe is made so scarce, eh? and the water people drink is so scarce that now they can only sell. Eh? They think of how they can turn air into profitable proposition. So they make sure the air is scarce, oxygen, so they can be giving people uh, oxygen in tubes they can buy little huh? <laughs> or soil I mean it can it can it, once you start it can be c developed itself you know mm -hmm. right yeah and I think why the, why same, the same by the way with the um, Matigari mm -hmm. uh, the one you had the novel this is a novel Matigari is a novel which I wrote when I was in exile in London from 1982 when I found myself again exile is like prison in one way huh? because in both is the element of being uh, detached from the people it's like you're moved away from the people so either in prison like internal exile in your own country or outside like external uh, exile although there are differences of course so in London anyway I said I'm in London I'm committed to writing the Kikuyu language how I'm going to do, now that I'm in London, in an English-speaking environment, can I do it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? That's how I can write a novel, Matigari. And Matigari is a bit satiric because it's really, again, a, past, a, f a former freedom fighter who comes out of the, for many years after, you know, I mean, there's kind of magical element, but he's, he's going around the country really asking for, for simple thing about truth oh my god remember i wrote this a long time ago not currently mm -hmm. <laughs> all right <laughs> okay please he's about truth where can where can i find truth in this land okay 
So he goes teachers to other people. About all he's asking is about truth. In the meantime, there is in the country also a minister for truth. You see, so there is minister for truth, but this guy is going around asking where is truth, as if he's challenging the ministry of truth, and so on. Uh, when the novel was published in Kenya, I was in exile at the time in uh, 1987, I, no, 86, I believe, or thereabout, anyway. Uh, the, this character who goes about asking people, where can one find truth and justice in this land? That's, that's the only question he asks. He has no answers. But he asked that question throughout, you know. Uh, but the people who are talking about this character talked of him as if he's a real living person, right? Uh, because when people talk about films, and so they don't always talk about directors, no. Sometimes they talk about the character who is there or the chief actor and so on. The same with the novels. So I talk about Matigari as if he was a real living person, you know. At that time in Kenya, not now, but at that time in Kenya, uh, rumor mongering had been banned. You can't rumor monger. You know, you could go to prison for so many, I don't know, uh, or even many years, okay? Yeah. But how about this guy who is going around the country asking questions about truth and justice? Uh, so uh, the dictator thought that he was a real living person, mm. right? So the order literally was go and arrest this rebel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> only they find that he was not, he was just a character in fiction, yeah. And literally that's how the book came to be literally arrested in mm. Kenya. The, there was an operation, Matigari, uh, in which the police would go to different bookshops in civilian clothes, pretending they are booksellers from somewhere else, and their stock is finished. Uh, we like to buy whatever you have, and of course the bookseller would be very happy to take out whatever they had, you know, and of course they will show their police badge, take the books. They also went to publisher's house, uh, you know, the publishing house, and took all the copies of Matigari. So there was a time when Matigari could not be read in Kenya, in Gikoyo, or English. In fact, for many years, unfortunately, or fortunately, he existed only as a translation in the streets of London. <laughs> 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 you could find him in the streets of London, but not in Kenya, <laughs> right? Of so. that time. Now, it is, you can read Matigari in Kenya, by the way, just to clarify. So it, it's hard not to read a lot of your work in the context of our current administration and um, uh, in this sort of erasure of language that, that they're trying to do, particularly in this country with Spanish in California, Arizona, Texas, um, and the sort of rise of big man rule once again you know, all over the world. You know, uh, It's interesting to see that cycle. Do you still have faith? in the power of memory and story to, to yeah, compare? Yeah, story, 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 talk about possibility. Remember, by the way, let's remember that uh, the first scientific imagination was actually, you know, storytelling. Eh? People would ask themselves, why does a leopard have uh, marks or whatever? Or how did uh, this ha come to happen? And people told stories how that came to happen. They are trying to make, they are asking questions <laughs> and try to answer them in the only way they could, you know. Huh? Uh, there is an epic I'm reading, Mahabharata is an Indian epic, and uh, many people don't like it because of the hierarchical character of the, but it's very revealing, really, you know, when you read it, the sheer flight of imagination is really, you know, um, um, uh, incredible. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, in, in the book you say, to write for, speak for, and the work for the lives of peasants and workers was the highest call of national duty. I'm wondering what drives you today? 
What drives you uh, in your writing? The same, really. I, okay, two things. First of all, I've been fighting for, not fighting really, let me, I've been trying to articulate uh, a democracy of languages and cultures and so on. Because what I found is that uh, there's nothing wrong with many languages in any one nation or in the world, you know. The problem is not their manyness, okay? It's not their quantity. It's their made to relate to each other on the basis of hierarchy, okay? My language, my culture is better and higher than your culture, and therefore, by implication, you know, I, who made this language, and the history covered by that language is really the ideal at which everybody else must arrive at. This hierarchy of inequality of power between languages and cultures, it reflects inequality of power between cultures, also inequality of power at the economic and the political level. It's not just, but it expresses in terms of language. You know, my language higher than your language, or my culture is higher than your culture. You know, now the way, the way I put it uh, today, this is why I summarize that uh, monolingualism is the carbon monoxide of cultures. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Multilingualism is the oxygen of cultures. You know. When cultures, even economy I have to relate on on this a network of equal give and take is a very different type of relationship from the hierarchy hierarchy of inequality of power, whether at the economic level, at the political level, at the cultural level, in yeah, a psychic level, okay? Yeah. So languages have a lot to give to each other. Just as cultures, can, they have this capacity of give and take, okay? Um, but when put in a hierarchy, it means that some cultures and peoples and their histories have been subservient to others and so on. It happens also well, yeah, anyway. It's, it. it's quite, com not complex really, because one yeah. can see it. In reality, okay, put it this way. Why is it that in every colonial situation in America here, in New Zealand, in Canada, Japan, you listen to Korea, you know, when the colonizer or the power counterpart, they always, nearly always, impose their language on the colonized. Not only do they impose their language, but they associate negativity, shame, and humiliation to the languages of the conquered, right? Or put it this way, today, you and I can go to university and we can take many languages, in some, some, some universities they require that you get two or other languages, okay? Fine. But they don't tell you, say you're an English speaker and you go to France to study a degree in philosophy or France or something, they don't tell you that you're not to learn French, you must first of all give up English, <laughs> right? Yeah, you c <laughs> they don't because you can, you can have English and then add to that any other French or Zulu or any other language. But in a colonial city of dominated and dominating, always it's glory to the language of power of the colonizer and gory. You know gory? Like blood? Mm -hmm. Gory <laughs> to the language of the conquered. Right. Then 
you and I say, why do people do that? Do they do that because they, oh, they like, oh, how beautiful it is to make people uh, learn our languages and so on. <laughs> no, it's not for the aesthetic pleasure of doing so. <laughs> <laughs> there is something else, you know. So we could go again behind the language and look at the politics. We look at the economic arrangements or the we arrangement of wealth in a society. We, what, what is this thing is telling us something else, right? But they won't tell us it's only about one language being higher and better than others. Unfortunately, in the world today, what's happening, a language can be, like Spanish language, for instance, uh, marginalizes uh, other languages in Spain, but definitely marginalizes Native American languages in South America. You know, uh, but within the USA, Spanish is marginalized, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so this reproduction of hierarchies of an equal power relationship, you know. This is what is happening in so many countries, you know. That's what we are seeing. Again, this as hierarchy of an equal power at the economic, political, cultural, even psychic level, you know, as the order, as the ideal society, you know. Uh. Mm -hmm. So to me, language is very, we, we have to take language very, very seriously, yeah? but not by itself. Language by itself, a language by itself is just a language, right? And each language has its own musicality. And there's no language which is more of a language than any other language, mm -hmm. really. You know, uh, that hierarchy of an equal power relation at the level of language reflects other inequalities of power in that uh, society, mm -hmm. yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Um, we, have, we have only a couple of minutes, so I'm wondering if there are any questions mm. from our fabulous audience. You've all been very, very patient and wonderful. Thank you all. Um, 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 yeah, yeah. Uh, why, why the, I'm glad you asked that question because one of the, I think sometimes errors we make or I make sometimes is to think of ideas as not being, uh, but what I've come to think as not being, as, as they're not practical, you know, it's quite a realm of practice and, you know, and doing things, which is fine, but ideas are also very important. Because the question of ideas is an arena of struggle. Not only ideas, but images. The image is an, are is an arena of struggle. How to shape, how to see the world, you know, huh? and how to think about the world, you know. So, in that sense, whether one is at the university or at the primary school and so on, you know, uh, what is the tissue is really that struggle of different ideas about society. Yeah? This is that issue, not only ideas, but also images, right? You know, there's a struggle how to shape, you know. That's why today now there's a lot of talk about truth and fact and so on, truth. And what's truth, what is fact, not fact, uh, you know. Yeah, it's a struggle of ideas. And at the realm of ideas, there has always been struggle. There is always struggle going on at the level of ideas. Because ideas do not exist by themselves. They are also, also reflecting other oh, things going on. <laughs> it's ideas only voice other things going on in society as well. You know. But at the same time, they are very, very important. Uh, so, you won't say that Ivory Tower 
stay there, that's no, no problem. But make sure that the ideas you are fighting for, <laughs> uh, they are, remember the ideas you fight for, I fight for, they are on one or the other side in a social struggle or in a political social struggle. There's, there's nothing like ideas which exist by themselves. Huh? They are always reflecting, in a way, something else uh, going on uh, in society. Thank you. Um, Either it's time I can give one example. Mm, but, uh, yeah, let's let's get another. Do you want to give an, an example of that? Or do you? Uh, no, I'll let me think. Oh, OK. okay. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah. It's good to see you again, Fugi. Um, uh, uh, my name's Andy C. I'm the spokesperson for Revolution Books. Uh, Fugi, but maybe you c I could draw you out on an example of uh, how your ideas came to shape that maybe people don't quite understand that you, your life transcended the era of colonialism through the War of Liberation by the uh, Land and Freedom Party, the betrayal of that revolution, and then seeing what, what happened, and that you had to confront that battle of ideas that was actually taking place on the ground, because you were imprisoned by the new African government that was a neo, became a neo, very quickly, a neo-colonial government. So I think maybe that's a story that a lot of people here don't, don't know, but I would invite all of you Here's the commercial. To come to Revolution Books, where there is a place for the imagination, not only of what has been and what is today, but also what could be in the future. We're at uh, 132nd Street and Malcolm X Boulevard. Uh, Googie is a great friend and opened our store uh, for us. Yeah, when I came here in 19... Uh, okay, I can tell you my Revolution Bookshops. When I came here in 19... In exile, first time, and I was... There are many political prisoners in Kenya at the time. It was a dictatorship. But Kenya was uh, uh, revered in the West. The, no, it was very imp almost impossible to get a platform and to say, no, this is what's happening in Kenya at the time. People are being imprisoned. People are being killed for their ideas. People are, there's not, but no, no, they were saying, no, Kenya, the logic was like, like, Kenya is a friend of the West. Therefore, Kenya is democratic. Therefore, Kenya cannot be undemocratic. Therefore, what you are saying, we are very suspicious of what you are saying. So it was very, actually very difficult to get a platform, you know, uh, to talk not about me this time, but about the other political prisoners which were uh, left in Kenya. And uh, a revolution bookshop, it used to be somewhere on... S near 16th, yeah, 16th Street earlier. And that, um, and they gave me a platform. I was really very happy. And then they gave me a big interview in which I articulated the conditions going on in Kenya, you know, uh, at that time, you know. Uh, this was 1986. Yeah, it's something like that. Yeah, yeah. It was very difficult for Kenyans in those days to articulate what's going on. Uh, mm. Nobody believed them. I mean, Dominant for social, did not believe that Kenya could be, could do these things. Is a friend of the West, uh, is uh, therefore democratic, therefore uh, cannot do what you are saying they are doing. Yeah, hmm. but you know, later people get to see the reality of what's happening in the country. Yeah, mm -hmm. mm. all right. And not just in Kenya, actually, quite frankly, in uh, most of the formerly. Yeah. Colonized world. Yeah. Uh, thank you. I please uh, buy books, learn more. Uh, thank you all for your time, and thank you, Googie. Thank you. It was an honor.